All right, Bismillah. So what we were speaking about last time, just, just for the first like five, 10 minutes, if I have to fix a connectivity issue, just pardon me. Um, just want to make sure that people online are able to tune in. So what we were chatting about last time was the importance of following the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in all of our activities, uh, in addition to our worship. And what Imam Haddad mentioned and he, where we stopped was he talked about the Sunnahs of uh, walking, the Sunnahs of talking, the Sunnahs of going about your day, um, and now we're going to get into some of the, the sunan that the Prophet ﷺ would have in other daily acts of his life, right? So we'll start with sleeping, and then we'll get into uh, some of the sunnahs of eating, and then some of the sunnahs in relation to um, uh, some of the sunnahs in relation to other daily tasks that somebody might might go through, inshallah. And I think the, the context that's really really important here that we also said last time was that when somebody makes the intention to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, just know that that is the absolute best way possible to do anything. There is no better way possible to do something than in alliance, in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It might seem, oh, you know, we, let's say with regards to the sunnah of eating, right? Oh, someone might say, oh, well, we have uh, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to eat with his hands and to eat with a few specific fingers. Someone might say, well, that was back then, maybe they didn't have utensils, and so now, you know, we're so advanced and and we want to use our, our, our various utensils and, and, and compostable utensils and so on and so forth, why would we need to follow that? It's not, you don't have to follow it, but just know that that is the most virtuous way to do it in the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught them to eat. And these types of things, the, the important realization here to have is that these are not mundane activities. What the Sunnah does is it turns things that seem outwardly mundane into inwardly powerful activities that allow one throughout their day to get spiritual assistance and spiritual assistance because somebody won't be praying 24-7, someone will not usually be fasting all the time, someone will not be reciting Quran all the time, and so on and so forth. But somebody, through their intention and through their following of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, they are able to achieve a state of consistent spiritual progress throughout their days. And that's why the Sunnah in these different actions that we're talking through are really, really, really important. Um, if somebody isn't there yet, though, that's okay. But the goal should just be to magnify these things, to see them as something great, and then to try our best throughout our life to try to get there. And if it's not for our whole life, to at least have a period of our life where it's okay, I'm going to try at least in this portion of my life to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so we'll get in now into the sunnah of, of sleeping. Um, and this is something you're going to do every single day of your life, right? Sometimes people will sleep more than one time a day. Um, but at least in the night, everybody is going to lie down and go to sleep. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he's teaching you. He's like, hey, I care about you so much. The aspect of it is that somebody sleeps and they lie down on their right side. They face the Qibla, ideally. So someone's face is on their right side and they're lying down on their right side and they're facing the Qibla. And that they are, uh, they go into a state of repentance. They, and they enter into a state of repentance. What does that mean? It means that somebody enters into a state of, Ya Allah, forgive me for what I did today. Right? You actually take yourself to account. You take yourself to account for the sins that you might have done that day. And you, you ask Allah to forgive you. And so it is before you go to sleep because the sleep is, as they say, the, the, the little sister of death. Sleep is uh, very much a metaphor where Allah is trying to teach us every single day. You may fall asleep, but there might be a day where you may not wake up. And there will be a day eventually where Allah will put you into a sleep where you won't wake up in this abode. Your next time you'll, you'll wake up will be in the abode of the grave, right? And everybody else will think that you're gone, but you will be in transition into a different life. And so that is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. So that's the first part of it. The second then some, what somebody would do to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet is to read the three barakah of those surahs would be transmitted to his entire body. And so that would be uh, the second step that someone does. So you write down, you write, lie down on your right side, remind yourself of death, repent for all of your sins, and read these three quls. Now, what is the benefit of these three quls? Well, we'll get to it, inshallah. What is the benefit of these three quls, the, the, of, of these surahs, is that it puts somebody into a state of protection. It puts someone into a state of protection. Now, when somebody is asleep, you are more vulnerable to the unseen forces. Someone is more vulnerable to the unseen forces. And so when somebody is in a state of protection, and they are seeking Allah's protection by following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now they are going to be in a much better state than had they left, been left vulnerable. 
Um, so that would be another another step. Yes, question? Um, I'm just reminding you that he didn't read, so he wouldn't read them, he would recite. He yeah. The prophet would read them. Right, right, yeah. But when it meant there was recite, he would He's recite. Yes, thank you. Um, so the, the Prophet ﷺ would recite recite these. When, when we say recite, we're, we're say read, we're, we're meaning kind of colloquially that somebody here um, would go ahead and, and recite these three surahs. Um, so the next step after that is that somebody would recite what's called the Ayatul Kursi. The Ayatul Kursi. The Ayatul Kursi is um, a very, very, very potent and powerful verse from the Quran. Allahu la ilaha illahu hayyu qayyum la takhudu sunnatu wa nanom lahu ma fi samati ma fi al the end of the of the verse, then that is also extremely um, strong protection, extremely strong protection. Now, this is the time that when someone is asleep is the time many, many times when dark forces are trying to attack somebody, right? And now this, again, may sound kind of strange, but it's, this is the reality. This is the reality that somebody who give, leaves themselves vulnerable in any moment when they are heedless and they are not doing what Allah would, would want them to do, they leave themselves vulnerable to the jinn and to the shayateen. When the jinn and the shayateen, they enter somebody or they, put, they try to bother somebody while they're in a state of sleep, that person's dreams are affected. That person's state of sleeping is affected. That person could potentially have insomnia and anxiety and so on and so forth because you are not in the state of protection. It doesn't mean, and we ask Allah protection, it doesn't mean that would happen necessarily, but it is it, the, the vulnerability is left. Right. And so, again, this is where the sunnah, it puts a fortress, puts, a port, puts up a fortress. Right. So then the next step here would be that somebody is recites. Those are the three for protection. Does anybody have any questions? Question? Uh, a comment. Okay. So we'll save the comments, inshallah, till the end of the section. If anybody has any questions on the protection. Okay. So then we'll go to... The, the, the next step of this is the Prophet ﷺ would encourage us to recite, and I'll actually give the, the context for this. So one time, uh, Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, that she came, the daughter, the blessed daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, she, the Prophet ﷺ had acquired um, some, some uh, after one of the battles, there was a large amount of uh, people that had come with the battle Right with the spoils of the uh, spoils of war, that the Prophet ﷺ was potentially they could have been available to assist the Prophet ﷺ or assist the companions. Right, and so I say the Fatima radiallahu anha she went to the Prophet ﷺ and she said they were extremely tired. Her and Sayyidina Ali, they were very 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 exhausted with everything they had to do. Right, these people they lived a very very tough life. They weren't like just because they were they had they have high status in this deen does not mean that they had a very easy life. No, the higher status someone has, the more difficult someone's life is. And so they had gone through immense physical difficulty for just taking care of everything throughout the house, getting the water from the wells, the amount of miles that they had to walk, how hot it was, how much the work that they had to do to prepare their food and so on and so forth. So she went to the Prophet ﷺ, she said, Ya Rasulullah, she, she, she went to him actually and she didn't, she didn't say anything. She went to him to ask him, is there somebody who you could assign to assist me, like a servant? <coughs> but she didn't ask him. She was too shy, so she returned. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he came in. Right? He knows what's going on, ﷺ. He has an intuition, right, as, as he said. He has what's called firasa, um, the most powerful intuition possible, where he understands what's going on. Without you having to say anything, he'll be able to figure it out completely. No issue at all. So... He went to Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu anha and he said, you know, what is, what is it? Why did you come? Right? And they explained to him, you know, we're exhausted. There's so much work to do. There's so many things to do. We were potentially seeking some, some help from uh, uh, and hoping that you could potentially assign a servant to us. And he said, how can I do this to you when the people of Ahl Sufa, Ahl Sufa were people who um, were very, very, very poor. Like they barely had enough clothing to cover themselves, let alone enough food. So how can I give you help when they don't even have enough food? I have to help them. He said, let me teach you. Can I not teach you something though that is better than what you were asking for? And they said, please. And so he said, before you go to sleep every night, recite three times SubhanAllah, three times, uh, not three times, 33 times SubhanAllah, 33 times Alhamdulillah, and then 34 times Allahu Akbar. And this, be, this will assist you in all of the tasks of the following day. 
It will assist you in all the tasks of the following day more than somebody could have assisted you like as a, as a human being, you having a helper. Now this is tried and tested. Someone has like a lot of stuff that they have to do the next day. They have some, they want to have a productive day with their job or with school. This is tried and tested. We recite before you, as you're going to sleep, as you're lying down, 33 times subhanAllah, 33 times alhamdulillah, 33 times Allahu Akbar. And so what does that mean? What does that mean? That this is again a form of barakah that will assist you. What is someone doing? Someone is saying, ah, Ya Allah, I'm placing my trust in you and I'm glorifying you and I'm praising you. And through that, somebody hopes that they will see success in their life. Through that, somebody hopes that they will see success in their life. Yes, question. Uh, in one narration, it's 34 times for Allahu Akbar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you have other narrations that will say that someone is 33, 33, 33, and then la ilaha illallah wa la sharika mulku alhamdulillah wa ala kulli shin qadir as the, as the final one. Um, so that, those are the du'as in relation to sleeping. So you have three times one time each, someone recites that. Then somebody recites Ayatul Kursi. So they blow the first three into their hands and this takes like a minute to do. And then Ayatul Kursi takes like 30 seconds to do. And then these other ones take like a minute. And so you're talking about a total of two minutes maybe and then somebody makes strong intention before they go to sleep and you're talking about a very, very barakah filled sleep. Very, very blessing filled sleep, right? Versus sleep just being a mundane activity. Someone's going dreaming about burgers and this and that and all sorts of things, right? And then there's people who they're present when they're asleep and it's a completely different type of sleep. They have a completely different interaction with the unseen realm. And one of the signs of somebody's spiritual progress, it doesn't have to be the case, but it is a sign is that somebody starts to have more access to the unseen realm via dreams. So you'll have different people potentially start visiting you amongst the awliya and then eventually amongst the prophets, right? Somebody might have the prophets visiting them in the highest form. The prophet himself will visit somebody in a dream when someone is in touch with the spirituality. It does not have to be the case, but it is. it, it, it starts with these basic things. So it starts with these basic things, right? Somebody might have a dream uh, of themselves at the Kaaba and in, 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 in special places and so on and so forth. Yes? I think a good analogy pertaining to this is like, um, you're saying like, do things to protect yourself while you have control, because when you're awake, you have control to not be heedless, and you have control, but when you get in that dream state, you, you feel like you're out of control and things are just happening. I think a good analogy could be that um, our life is like our day, our day week, we, we have to be careful and try to do things that create barakah and protection, protect us before we go to sleep. So similarly, our life, we have to do those same things before we go to the greater sleep. Exactly. You know, we, we have control now. And then when we get in our sleep, sleep, it's like we're out of control. Right. Right. No, no. Alhamdulillah. That's exactly it. Yeah. That the more somebody, while you have a chance, while we have a chance, that we try to do the actions, the better it will be, inshallah, when we no longer have that chance. Um, Okay, alhamdulillah. Sundiara, do you know if it got fixed? The Wi-Fi? Nah. Nah? I think the modem is super old. Okay, alhamdulillah. Let me just try something. Um, I... Sorry? No, it didn't come on. Yeah, I'm trying to fix it. He said the other one was up, though. Is it? Yeah. Could you ask him which one it is? The TK... I don't have the, if I could just get the, the, the password for that, then I could lo log into the YouTube. Sorry guys, forgive me. Um, could I try that out? Because my hotspot keeps dying. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I try yours out? Sorry guys. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So as we get that, yes? Yeah. So 33 times you glorify Allah and you say subhanAllah. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. So that would each be said one time till you reach 33. You can count those on your fingers, right? Um, you know, you have 12, four fingers, three each, 12. So you do that in sets of three until you get to 33. Um, and then, and then you have 33. Alhamdulillah. And so in that, you're praising Allah. You're saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And then you have 33 that you are saying Allah, or 34, you're saying Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. 
Thank you. So, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes, go up question. Yes, there is a du'a, and that was the next one we we're going to get to. The du'a is right here. Bismika. One second here. Sorry, let me just try to reset this stream. Bismillah. Okay. Um, so I say Muhammad. So the du'a that you want to say before you go to sleep, and it's for those who have the text, it's listed here on page 54. Bismika, Allahumma Rabbi, wa da'atu janbi. Wabika, wabismika, arfa'u, fagfilli, dambi. Allahumma qa'inni, Allahumma qinni, adabik, yoma, tajma'u, ibadak. And so you're saying in the name, uh, in your name, Ya Allah, my Lord, do I rest my side, and in your name do I raise it, so forgive me for my sins. Ya Allah, protect me from your chastisement on the day when you gather your servants. And so you're asking Allah, right? Kind of what we just mentioned, some of this in, in, um, in English, the intentions that you're making, you're asking Allah. The more potent thing would be to do the three quls, the ayatul kursi, and this dua. This dua from the sunnah. If somebody does not have the dua memorized, right, then you would just make the same dua in English, right? And you Essentially the same meaning that, Ya Allah, I'm turning to you. I ask that you forgive me for all of my sins, right? And that I ask that you protect me in my sleep and on the Day of Judgment. And again, so what you're doing here is you're reminding yourself of the Day of Judgment. Somebody would be reminding themselves of uh, the lesser death and the greater death. Did that answer the question? Oh, yeah. yeah. I heard a different one. I learned Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. Bismika Allahumma amutu wa ahya. So, bismillah, in the name of Allah. Uh, live and die alhamdulillah that, I'm, I'm, there's, there's various narrations so I'm sure that I, I, I don't know that one but I'm sure it's there yeah so um, uh, there are various du'as someone can do right I think we've probably heard at least three or four different types that somebody could do uh, and of course the shorter ones will be easier to memorize so the one that was mentioned um, will inshallah be, be easier to memorize so those would be the the supplications and the recitations in a to do before sleeping, right? And then there's one more thing that someone would want to do. Does anybody know what else um, you want to have done before you go to sleep, ideally? Yes? I actually heard that before you leave your bed with your garment, you need to wipe it three times. Just try to wipe, try to wipe the bed three times, dust everything off, yes, and then? Uh, best, like, take a shower and be completely clean. Yeah, ideally you're in a state of wudu, at minimum. Someone is in a state of wudu while sleeping, right? And so, why, does somebody know why you would want to be in a state of wudu while sleeping? Like, what would be the, what would be the reason for that? What does wudu do? Uh, yes? Exactly, exactly. Mashallah, spot on. Someone, you, that you're in a state of ritual purity, and as a result, you're protected from the unseen forces. Right, um, the wudu throughout the day protects somebody. Throughout the day, you if you are about even if you are not in a state of prayer, as we mentioned before, someone should try to be in a state of wudu, even if they're not about to pray. Right, but if you're especially about to go into a conversation you know is difficult and it's going to potentially get into attention and so on and so forth, someone should definitely be in a state of wudu. Right, because you will protect yourself from your own nafs, from your own ego, and protect yourself from the shaitan. And then when you go to sleep, as was mentioned, you are no longer able to control anything. And so now again, you want to put another fortress. These are, this is just about spiritual fortresses you're putting around yourself, right? So wudu has a fortress. The ayatul kursi has a fortress. The three quls have a fortress. The, uh, the dua that we recited has a fortress. The subhanallah, alhamdulillah, allahu akbar has a fortress, right? And inshallah, you do that, you place your reliance on Allah, you'll be, you'll be in a very, very good spot while you sleep. Yes? And, and then uh, spiritually, um, we're protected by our purity of heart. 
So like when we have a pure heart, that is a form of protection for us. It's like even silence is a form of protection. And if you have a pure heart, that's a form of protection. So, so washing the exterior or voodoo, making voodoo, is, is, that, is that on the outside. So you want to be pure and clean on the inside and pure and clean on the outside. So you're not off. Right. You're more perfect for God. Right. And so among the inward etiquettes of sleeping, there's actually one of the, the famous narration that um, one time a man walked into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ said, this man is, is a man from paradise. And so one of the Sahaba, he was like, this man's a man from paradise, but what does he do? So he went to the man and he said, hey, can I stay with you for three days? Um, and he said, okay, sure. Uh, and so he observed him. He, he stayed with him during the day didn't see anything extra. At nighttime, he did not see this man praying long qiyam al at the hajjad or anything. He did all his basics. So he observed him. He didn't see him do wake up for any extra fasts, right? All the things you would expect somebody who was a person of paradise to do. And so the, it continued and continued. And then after three days, he, he came and he told the man, you know, he said, actually, the reason I asked to stay with you is because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that you are a person from paradise and I observed you I didn't really see anything special about you. What's, so what's up? Like, you know, what, what's, what's, what is it? He said, I can't really think of anything. The only thing I can think of is before I go to sleep at night, I forgive everybody in my heart and I clear my heart of all negative feelings essentially towards anybody, right? And he said, and the Sahaba responded that, and that is the deed, right? That is the deed. So there is the inward etiquette. You don't want to be in a state where like, you're sleeping mad at people and holding grudges against people and angry with people and so on and so forth. Ideally, somebody wants to sleep in a state, as was mentioned, of outward purity and of inward purity. And inward purity is very, very important here, as, is it, import as it is important throughout the day. So that's like with regards to when somebody goes to sleep. Now and then he's going to list the other aspects of the sunnahs of sleep. So the next thing he mentions is that somebody wants to be mindful of their time. So he says, don't oversleep. At max, someone should sleep eight hours, right? More than that, he says, you're wasting your life. Somebody lives 60 years and you spend 24 hours in a day, eight hours of the 24, that's one third. So somebody's art 20 years of their life for 60 years of life has gone to sleeping, right? So he says at max, that's what someone should be doing. Um, and if it's less and someone is using that time to worship, even better. Then he mentions that if somebody can take, this is hard in our society, but if possible, it is a sunnah to take a nap in the midday. So in, right after dhuhr time, roughly, right, let's say around 1230 or so, one o'clock, someone would take a short nap. And it's a sunnah of the Prophet And it assists one, Imam Haddad mentions, it assists one in waking up to do extra prayers at night, right? Because if somebody is up at like 5 o'clock, let's say, and they start their day, they pray the hajjud, so on and so forth, and then fajr, and then like by the time it's 1, they're pretty tired. Even a second cup of coffee might not be enough, right? Uh, even if it's, a, if it's a double espresso shot latte, or anything, it still might not be enough. So you might you may take a 30-minute nap or a 40-minute nap. Now that refreshes somebody. As all these theories coming out now, all the things the Prophet would do, short, small, quick naps, they're saying, oh, this is highly productive. Intermittent fasting, oh, this is highly productive. All the stuff coming out in kind of modern productivity writings. As it's already been in our tradition. Now, it's not a good thing if we start to adapt it because of the writings that are coming out now. We should ideally adapt it with the intention that it's in our tradition already. Right? So this would be another sunnah. It's hard to do again with work and whatnot. But if somebody is able to take it on, mashallah, that is a sunnah of sleeping. And then he mentions the spiritual realm. You're stopping provision from reaching you. And he has um, a different, different, uh, and things that will bring more barakah in someone's life to get easier. And you keep going and going. And same thing, spirit, these always says try not to regularly sleep after Asr and try not to regularly sleep after Maghrib. And Maghrib, if somebody who sleeps, then what you do is you ask Allah for protection, you turn to the left. So if somebody sees a really, really, um, inshallah. I, I have a question on, Yep, on you. So the question is, if somebody has a really, really rough, that might not be advised, um, because that would be... There's a lot of examples of dream interpretation. The last thing you mentioned is, what is the sunnah of actual sleeping? Right? What is and, and so on and so forth. They don't have electricity, right? So you, in those days, on him, according to many of the scholars. Sometimes Netflix shows and so on, up, and they wake up as we... Fajr is the time 
when a lot of and barakah will come from somebody being awake when the time of Fajr enters to lie down. Um, yes, question. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I know this, the prayers are emphasized, and there's a um, Allah mentioned in the Quran to uh, doubt that that's the case. Yeah, I don't know if anybody knows the hadith around that. Yeah, sorry, I, just don't, I don't want to misquote if I don't know. Yeah. No, no. Okay, so then the next thing that he gets into, so we, we covered off, right? So now Imam Haddad, what he's doing is going to like the bare human was that, um, sh you know, not, not sleeping on your stomach. He says when you begin eating, you always begin with Bismillah. I think we know this in all of our situations. Someone starts with Bismillah in the name of Allah. Allahumma, barik lana fima razaqtana wa atimna khayran minhu. And so you are essentially asking Allah, and religion, our religion has a lot of emphasis on cleanliness, then um, when somebody is eating with a group of people, the etiquette is that your hand is not like going all over the bowl, right? So usually what people would do rather than have their own plates is people would eat out of a kind of communal plate. And so you do not want to be like, oh, you got a nice piece of chicken there. Let me grab that and, you know, so on. And so you, you, you eat with what's the closest to you when you're eating by yourself and when you're eating with other people, right? That is the adab of, of eating. And then somebody should eat not from the middle of the plate, but the sunnah is to eat from what's closest to you, right? So you have food that's closest to you. You start with eating that rather than start. This is really, really important in our times of like overabundance and wasting a lot of food. I'm talking like any piece of rice, whatever it is, somebody finishes it. The believer is like, oh, now it's dirty. No, 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 no. You clean the food and it's specifically mentioned to not leave it for the shayateen. To not leave it, right? So you drop a little bit. Just know that if you saw somebody you loved and that person that you loved did something in a certain way, if you really loved them, you would just want to do it the way that they did it. That's what love is. When someone loves somebody, they're like, how would they do something, right? How did they look? How did they act? How did they walk? How did they talk? How did they eat? And that is at the essence of following the sunnah of the Prophet You can't really follow the sunnah if you don't have love. If it's just this like ritualistic thing, you're doing it, but it's missing the heart. The heart comes when somebody has love. And when someone has a lot of love for the Prophet they will want to do things in the way that he did it, regardless of what's popular in modern times, regardless of what's popular. Somebody will want to do things in the way that he did it. We have a lot to get through. Is it a question? Okay, I'm going to get through this section because we just have 10 minutes and, and um, we'll save it for the end unless it's a question. So then the next sunnah with regards to eating is that somebody has general gentle conversation with people. It's a sunnah to eat with people and to try to not eat by yourself, right? And then somebody actually has conversations and um, has good etiquette and good manners while sitting and eating with people who are around them. Right. Uh, and he mentions here that you ideally same things everybody's, you know, we're taught to do when you're young. Someone's not chewing with their mouth wide open. Someone is not uh, trying to speak with food in their mouth and so on and so forth. These are all etiquettes from the sunnah. If somebody were to sit with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and share a meal, it would be the absolute best meal of their life. And it would be the absolute best company you could ever have. And it would be the most amazing someone has ever felt with the way that with uh, in, in ever having a meal. Because every single etiquette that the Prophet ﷺ did was dignified. As Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَلَكَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ And we have ennobled Bani Adam. We have ennobled Bani Adam. What does it mean to have ennobled Bani Adam? It means to have given them dignity. Allah has given the believers, given all of Bani Adam dignity. Right? The human being is, stands upright. We're not walking on all fours. There is a level of dignity attached. And there's a dignity with eating. There's a dignity with conversation. There's a dignity with as you go about your day, there's a dignity with talking and walking and sleeping and every single aspect of our deen has, uh, has, a dig has dignity and dignified ways associated with it. And then there is a dua after eating as well. So the basic dua after eating, if someone does not know, you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. You praise Allah. You don't want to get up from the table without thanking God. Right? You generally don't want to. You want to make sure you, Ya Allah, thank you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And then there's a, there's a dua that somebody would recite that he lists here that you would say, Alhamdulillah, Allahumma at'amani tayyiban fasta'milni salihan. Alhamdulillah, illadhi at'amani hada 
طعام ورزقني من غير حول مني ولا قوه من غير حول مني ولا قوه that you're saying ya allah praise be due to allah that oh allah you have fed me on goodness therefore use me in goodness and alhamdulillah to allah all praise be due to allah who fed me with neither any ability nor power on my part and this is something the believer doesn't just recite you reflect a little bit on that if it wasn't for allah and again in our context in our society most of us have never really felt hungry unless someone was like fasting and they were forcing themselves to be hungry but most people have not actually felt like sustained days of hunger because they don't have food right because they do not actually have food but what what the in especially in other societies where food was not abundant and it was difficult to to have food people would regularly be thanking allah for every single bit of food that they received for every single bit of food that they uh that they received because you didn't get it on your own if it wasn't for allah someone would not have been fed at all and someone would not have had sustenance and then he gets into another important part in this dua that you were asking allah ya allah you fed me from purity now use me you have fed me from goodness now use me in goodness use me to do good things because what you with the idea of you are what you eat is at the center of our tradition if somebody eats pure they will do actions of purity if somebody eats haram they'll do actions of haram it's very simple and it's the first thing someone should ask if they're caught up in certain bad deeds is what is my, what am i eating someone is not eating halal and here we mean uh uh like proper halal slaughtered food right some uh, food that is actually slaughtered in the name of allah not food that is slaughtered in the name of whatever whatever um you know the atheists at mcdonald's might be slaughtering it that's not what we're talking about we're talking about the food that is slaughtered in the name of allah that is the that is the goal for somebody to try to get to the point where they're trying their best to eat halal and tayyib food all the time right if someone cannot do that at least at minimum of course they're staying away from like alcohol and pork and so on and so forth but that's like the basics right and then ideally someone gets to a point okay especially depending on where they live if this these options are available they they should really we should really try our best to get to a point where halal is is the only type of food that we eat right and we find alternatives if we're really into fast foods and so on and so forth that there's other options that we can go to that are halal alternatives but there will be a direct impact and for anybody who doesn't know if there will be a direct impact not just try it for 40 days as it comes in a narration the one who eats halal for 40 days their heart will be purified and so try it for 40 days and if you try it inshallah you will see an immense benefit immense benefit because again actions are related to to the food that somebody eats to the food that somebody eats and lastly the last kind of aspect with relation to eating is do not be too concerned about the food that you are eating like the goal is not the food the goal is someone eats the meal enjoys the meal alhamdulillah and they get on with their day the goal is the sustenance and the energy it's not to be like obsessively focused on the taste of the food and is it like this way and is it a michelin restaurant and so on and so forth that's that's not that's not that's not um from our tradition as it comes in hadith the prophet sallam said the worst of my nation are those who eat luxurious food and their bodies grow on it their only concern lies with different kinds of food and clothing that's the, that's what they care about it's the only thing they care about and they speak pretentiously right so like everything is about the type of food somebody has the type of clothing someone wears and they speak in a very very arrogant way the prophet sallam is saying this is the worst of my nation you don't we don't want to be when we ask allah for protection we don't want to be from the worst of the ummah right we want to be from people that food is seen as this is fuel alhamdulillah i'm going to eat it right but that's again a higher virtue someone might not be at the, at that point the nafs generally speaking will try to make everything about food food taste food this is that's all the nafs wants always thinking about food in ramadan You know, what am I going to eat for iftar? It's just you just started the day, and it's like, what am I going to eat for iftar? That's the nafs. That's the nafs, the ego, the lower self. But if somebody starts to climb the stations of spirituality, food becomes less of a concern, and it's like, okay, I just need the food to give me energy, right? I just need the, need the food to give me. I enjoy it and taste good and say alhamdulillah, but it's not the main concern of like all the different types of food and a seventeen course meal and so on and so forth. Right? It becomes like um, the 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 association is not the most. the the food is not the most important thing that someone is is focused on and at the 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 last point i think that i was just just finished covering here is the food should be halal and then the income someone bought the food with should be halal right now you can buy 
halal meat, but if you bought it with the money that someone made dealing drugs or owning a liquor store, that's not permissible money. So the food is not going to be permissible. So the food that somebody eats will be haram. So the action someone will do will be haram. Now, this is important in relation to like the actions we see ourselves doing, children doing, so on and so forth. I, I, I have a number of people sometimes have conversations around things that like family struggling with, children are struggling with, right? Someone's caught up in drugs and so on and so forth. But you dig a little bit deeper and it's like every, the food that someone grew up in, grew up on was primarily haram. Right, and the income might have been primarily haram, and so now naturally the actions someone will be inclined to do will be generally haram. It doesn't always have to be the case, but it is. We're talking here about things that happen based on hadith of the Prophet So it could be the case, and so that's why the income should be permissible, the source, and then the source of the food should be permissible. And someone should, generally speaking, uh, try to make sure that you go, we go a little bit out of our way. We live, alhamdulillah, in the Bay Area in Oakland. It's not difficult. There's halal shops everywhere to get food. But if someone doesn't live in that type of area, it goes out of the way to make sure to try to be um, eating with, with halal food as it comes in a narration that the, the heart of the one who eats halal for 40 days becomes illuminated and wisdom begins to flow from their tongue. Right? And Allah honors this person with the type of renunciation of the world. Right? It's, this person is not obsessed with dunya. Allah gives them an honor uh, by, by cleaning their heart. This. So again, the purity of the heart starts to take place. But the one who eats suspect and prohibited things, you don't verify, someone's not sure, this starts to affect somebody. And the more careful someone gets, the more they're going to be like, okay, I'm at a place, but like 95% of the food here is pork. Maybe they have one fish option, but like if they're cooking all the fish with all the pork, you probably want to stay away from that. Maybe go to the other fish spot. Right? So then someone starts to get a more careful now. I don't want my, my food because it's going to come in my stomach and it's going to power the deeds that I do to touch all these other things that are not considered permissible. Right? But again, it takes um, step by it's It's important to, to, kind of, to do so step by step. And so if somebody is trying to go on this path, they're not eating from, uh, halal right now, they want to do it, the ideal situation would be that someone says, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm currently not doing so. I'm going to try for... 10% of my meals to eat halal. And then you increase it to half of my meals a week and then three quarters of my meals for the week and then all of the meals for the week. And see how it goes for a portion of, of weeks and a portion of days. You'll find very little cost difference, but you will see a major barakah impact in your life. right? And so that would be the step that, that somebody um, or the process that someone takes. And if they um, are still struggling with it, seek, seek Allah's assistance and know that following the sunnah in this case will have immense 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 assistance but and i again highly highly just recommend that we all we all try this out so for the sake of time inshallah we'll we'll wrap up here we didn't get to the final section we'll, we'll get to the final two um sunnas in the next section so just to just to wrap up we covered the sunnas of sleep so someone wanted to see if anybody can recap what those are and then we'll, the sunnas of eating and then we'll take two questions and then we'll end anybody remember the sunnas of sleeping and I can't see all the way, but uh, yes. Yep. 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 And then in your heart, you... Right. Yep. Very good. Yes. So I, sorry, it's loud uh, uh, because of the heater. You said produced unethically. Hmm. Yep. Right. Right, right, 
Right. Okay. That's a good question. So the, so the question was, uh, with regards to food, that uh, what exactly do we do with regards to unethical food, right? So like if something is produced unethically, that could be, right now there's a lot of the meat industry has a lot of unethical practices. Part of the produce industry has unethical practices. Um, there could be uh, problematic labor practices and so on and so forth. So Allah mentioned in the Quran that to eat halal and tayyib food. Halal is the slaughtering and tayyib is a purity of the food. Tayyib in this case would apply to ethically sourced, fair trade, uh, properly, uh, what's it, what, uh, grass fed, like all of those types of things that we're seeing in, in our time that would fall under this idea of tayyib food. Right now, somebody now this is where it, it kind of depends on how much someone wants to look into it. Ideally, somebody gets to the point where they're like, I really want all the food to eat that I eat is really, really pure. And so they'll pay more to get really local, pure food that they know the supply chain was done properly. Same thing with their clothing, right? They won't usually get clothing that's made in sweatshops. They'll go and they'll get like fair trade clothing, certified clothing, maybe even get stuff tailored. Like people will find these avenues. But that, that, that depends if someone can financially look into it and make that happen. At a minimum, it's halal. Ideally, it's halal and tayyib, as Allah does pair the two often in the Quran. And now that would mean that a lot of the meat industry and produce industry and so on and so forth, somebody would ideally inspect into it and say, okay, is this locally produced or is this, naturally, uh, uh, is this a national and international production? Um, are these animals raised in industrial farms or are they raised in... Uh, free range type farms and someone would look into it and then they would choose the better option that they have that would be the ideal um if if that makes sense so it, it is a, it is a concept that we have and it's actually a very very important concept uh that, that there's a quite a few um good talks given by uh, imam imam daud uh, daud yasin at zaytuna and sheikh hamza yusuf at zaytuna they've both given good talks about this idea of halal and tayyib food um, and kind of what does it mean in the context that we live in? Yeah. Anybody have, oh, actually, we'll finish off the review and then we'll end with questions. So, th so the sunnahs of sleeping, again, sleeping on the right side, making a um, intention and or seek, asking Allah for forgiveness, forgiving everybody who might have harmed you, right? Or you might hold a grudge against, reciting the three quls, three times, blowing them on their hands, wiping them over the whole body, reciting Ayatul Kursi, reciting the Dua that we mentioned before sleeping. Um, and and I, I mentioned already sleeping on your right side, right? And then the three, SubhanAllah, uh, 33 times, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar 34 times. Those would be, all of this can be done in two, three minutes. And inshallah, then someone goes to sleep and someone will sleep very calmly and happily, inshallah. So those are the sunnahs of sleeping. And then we mentioned the sunnahs of eating, which we'll just quickly review. Start the food with a du'a, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and then the other du'a we mentioned, to have a strong intention with the food that somebody is eating with the intention of worshipping Allah, and the intention the food gives them energy to worship Allah. And someone ends by saying alhamdulillah and doing the du'a that we mentioned while ending. Um, and then someone eats from pure sources of food, and the income should be pure, and ideally ethically sourced as well. Again, these are steps that somebody gradually tries to take. And if someone does all of this in relation to these two activities, we'll see a lot of noor in your life, a lot of light in your life, and a lot of barakah in your life. And if somebody doesn't, then the, it's always available if someone, when someone's ready to go ahead and access it, inshallah. Yes?
You may go to Trader Joe's, you may go to Whole Foods, you may go to Sprouts. And at least the idea is that you're seeking something, you know, tai. But the reality of it is, is that with all the bureaucracy and the processes of how things are gathered, how they're done, you know, you still may run into a crisis, you know. And so we just have to kind of really turn it up as best we can to kind of avoid it. And then look at our own food sources, you know. And even like earlier you mentioned, it's like the concept of eating a lot. You know, this is not from the Islamic tradition. You know, some of the audience say that if a person has more than two items on a the plate, then they, they've already entered their lives into the situation. You know, so I mean, you know, these are just things, these stories are just designed to give us something to look at, to gauge outside the Western project, like outside of the normalities of what we see in Western society, give us a more noble and honorable um, thing to shoot for. You know? Right, right. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Now, for those for those that were uh, that couldn't hear, that was very, very insightful. Jazakallah khair for mentioning that at the time, especially throughout throughout history and throughout Muslim history, food has been a very, very important aspect and central to Islamic spirituality, like set, absolutely central. And there was a heavy emphasis on producing your own food if possible, on making sure the source of the food is pure, and so on and so forth. And so, in our time, we have to be really, really. We have to find ways to try to go back to that if possible. And if not, at least be open to questioning kind of some of the, the corporate um, slogans that were fed often that we might think, hey, something is pure and so on and so forth, but that's not actually the case. And ideally, at least know that it's worth doing deeper due diligence um, rather than just kind of accepting it at, at face value. So, yeah, Sakhla Khair for mentioning that. So I know we're, we're coming late. Does anybody have any other questions? Yes, question. I can't, I can't hear you at all. I'm so sorry. The heater is on. Would, would, what would be considered food waste? No, no, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So someone asked, would composting or feeding animals and so on be considered food waste? No, no, no. Yeah, that would be, um, if someone has like a lot of fresh food available, and you can't finish it and nobody in your family wants to eat it, for sure feed it to the animals. Don't just throw it away. And then if, 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 if there's no animals around, then somebody would, um, somebody would, would compost it. Yeah, that would be, that would be ideal. Um, yeah, I feed my cat many a leftover. He enjoys it a lot. Any other, any questions on the sister side? Question? Comment. Okay, well, any other questions? Okay, comment. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate what, um, the, the comments that you're making. I was going to add on that when you were talking about um, that we're not supposed to eat too much. Uh, you know, we should probably share that um, it's good not to like fully satiate yourself, but to try to stop short, like purposefully stop short of fully satiating yourself because that's how the prophet said you're supposed to have heart air and part food, you know, as far as like liquid. So a lot the sooner is not to eat too much, not to fully satiate yourself, to try to cut back and leave yourself a little on the hungry side, you know, to to fight down your nerves. And so if you love the property and the sooner you're not gonna just overeat and fully stuff yourself, you just stop short, just eat some and not too much. Right. Right. And, okay. and then verify in the bottom. There's the most purpose in the bottom of the plate. So what I heard is the proper people trying to lick the bottom of his plate. Because there's supposed to be the most therapy in the, in, the, in the bottom. Yeah. Right. So so uh, what was mentioned was that it's important with regards to eating to also be careful how much somebody eats, right? And I think we were mentioning this, that the Muslim is not somebody who's overly concerned about the amount of food that they're eating. You try to limit and stop short of being full. And ideally, someone only eats as minimum that they need. But in our time, I remember I asked one of my teachers about this um, uh, a while ago, that you know, it's mentioned in the books, especially the books of spirituality, that like literally they would barely eat, right? just, just enough to get by. And he said, in our time, stopping three or four short is going to help you get to what they were able to do because of just how much in abundance and snacking and so on and so forth is available. Inshallah, that's something to keep in mind. 
um, and, and, and to try to also clean the plate fully. If someone is able to take their fingers and lick the plate, if someone is able to, to, to literally lick the bowl itself, it's from the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Sahaba to make sure every single portion of the food is wiped up and is clean, inshallah. So um, for the sake of time, Sidi, we'll, we'll go ahead and end. Um, it's, getting, it's getting quite late. Jazakallah um, khair for the contributions. Anybody have any final questions? Yeah, we'll go ahead and end with the dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik. Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka antu sami'u al-alim. Mutub alayna inna ka antu tawab ar-Rahim. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kunti min al-balimeen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fi al-akhirati hasnatan wa kinna adhab al-nar. Ya arham ar-Rahimeen. Ya Allah, we ask ya Allah that you forgive us. Ya Allah, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for anything it is that we have done or anything that we have said or anything that we have thought. Ya Allah, that you do not find pleasing, Ya Allah, allow us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in every way, Ya Allah, in every action, in every action of our life, Ya Allah. Allow the nur of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Ya Allah, to be part of our life, Ya Allah. Allow the nur of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be part of our life, Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Allah. And we ask that all those who are sick and struggling and going through difficulty, that you remove their difficulty and that you remove their sickness and that you give them a complete cure. And then anybody who has any issue or worry or anxiety or problem, that you cure it and that you remove it and that you fix our problems, Ya Arham Rahimin. We ask you for everything good that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for, and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he asked protection from. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barakatuh. Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam 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 w